I'm going to give a little bit of history. I want you to keep in mind that most of my life I was dealing with contraception more than homosexuality. I'm ordained 62 years, and I've been through both battles, you know? And that's why I see the connection between them so clearly. I give great credit to Richard John Newhouse for his article in the February issue of First Things, uh, the year 2005. It's called The Truce of 2005, question mark. Pages 55 to 61. Now, I use his material. I'll let you know that I'm using it, but I, all, for, the first part is my own. Let's begin. The breakdown of a code of morality during the last 60 years. The movement from natural moral law to situation ethics. With Joseph Fletcher's situation ethics came the tendency to do away with objective standards of morality in favor, in, in, in favor of a subjectivism highly fa favored with sentimentality. It was particularly applied to marriage and questions of sexual morality. The determining factor in evaluating a human act, according to Fletcher, was love, in quotation marks. But Fletcher did not define love. So people began to justify sexual acts outside of marriage in terms of their situation to one another or in terms of their physical gratification. Love, in quotation marks, was a supreme criteria overrating all other criteria. Just before the Second Vatican Council, while the church, in the church many theologians were supporting the view that married couples who could not afford another child for economic or health reasons were justified in practicing contraception, a group of German Jesuit theologians developed a theory called Proportionalism. According to this theory, if the good eff effects of an action outweigh the evil, the action is considered morally good. It was applied to the issue of contraception. Previously, it had been argued that contraception was contrary to the natural moral law and the divine law. You, we're told that the moral object was wrong in itself. The act had to be wrong in itself. Under no circumstances was it justified in the writings of Pius XI, Pius XII, and John XXIII. But those who believe that an action that is morally good and the good consequences were greater than the bad consequences went on to justify contraception and marriage for a variety of reasons which I need not detail. This was especially true in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., where I lived, where a group of priests, many of whom had received instruction under, the, under Charles E. Curran at Catholic University of America, they rebelled against the teaching of the church, as clearly enunciated by Archbishop Patrick O'Boyle. He promptly suspended them from hearing confessions and from preaching. The secular press loved it. Both Cardinal Boyle and the priest group appealed their decisions to Rome. Very few bishops publicly supported Archbishop O'Boyle. Some telephoned him to say he was on the right track. There was at least one wonderful exception, the Cardinal Archbishop of Philadelphia, John Kroll, who publicly supported him and made it clear to his priests. This suspension went on until uh, uh, somewhere around the end of 70, into 71. Then the Vatican sent a note in which it said that the Cardinal was right in his decision, but they wanted to restore the priest to ministry. There was no punishment of the priests for their rebellion. Uh, probably uh, Paul VI and the Vatican were afraid of schism and thought the lesser evil was that let things go for a while and try to improve the situation. This is according to George Weigel. It created an attitude that one need not worry about the magisterial teaching on any subject. O'Boyle accepted the decision. What we really had here in this situation 
was a truce between those who supported Archbishop of Boyle and those who supported contraception in marriage. At this point, I refer you, I really have referred you to the article by Richard John Newhouse in First Things, February. Newhouse draws an analogy between the truce in 1970 and the fear at the recent November 2000 letter on the norms for entrance to the seminary and into the holy orders from the Congregation of Education will be ignored. I will get to this later in the discourse. Let's get back to Washington. Subsequently, people continued to practice contraception outside the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. Little was said about the past controversy. In Washington, the two great moral theologians of the time support the archbishop in his diocese. They were Germain Grisset, who is still very much alive, and the late father, John Ford. They helped to bring peace to the archdiocese of, of Washington. Three years, about three years after the money Beach had been promulgated in the Selma fashion, on July 25th, 1968, it was no longer the subject of national bishops' conferences throughout the world. I was doing ministry in Washington throughout this entire period and through the turbulent period after Omani Vice was formally promulgated. I noticed that the bishop's failure to strongly support the Pope Paul VI on this issue led to all kinds of false teaching found in our newspapers and periodicals. Priests who preached the church's teaching from the pulpit were exceptional. To be sure, many priests told married penitents to follow your own conscience. Very soon, the issue of contraception was considered to be a dead issue. In one liberal diocese nearby, I opposed Charles Curran, 1976, on many issues, including contraception. In 1977, a book was written by the members of the Catholic Theological Society of America called Sexual Morality, which also approved contraception. You see how the wave was going against the teaching of our church. When that particular book was given some kind of approval by the Catholic Theology Society of America, about 60 or 70 people stood up and protested it. I was happy to be one of them. We, as a result, we decided to form a new, kind, a new group. The new group is a fellowship of Catholic scholars. Some people here, right here are members of that particular group. That was formed in about 1977. The purpose of the fellowship which has always been open to Catholic laity. In fact, the, the Catholic laity give all kinds of talks at our meetings. Uh, it continues to be present that they give the teaching of the church, not only in theology and philosophy, but in the literature and all the other fields, all the related fields, the Catholic point of view. Now let's move along. Personal observations on the connection between the contraceptive movement and the, and the gay movement. I always refer to the gay movement as contraception revisited. Let's turn now to Newhouse's article, Gays and the Priesthood, which illustrates the connection between the contraceptive controversy and the controversy over the morality of homosexual acts. The latter controversy followed the publication of the norms for admission of persons with same-sex attractions to seminaries and the diaconate which occurred in November. That is, the publicity came in November. Father Newhouse wonders whether the Vatican will treat those who are openly opposed to the doctrine's teaching with the silence which fell upon the church a few years after Homani Vitae. Be it noted that for almost 30 years, homosexual groups like Dignity, New Ways Ministry, and the National Association of Catholic Diocesan Gay and Lesbian Ministries have openly opposed magisterial teaching on homogenital acts without correction from bishops and religious order superiors. I also want to say something. One group, one lay group, fought a valiant battle against contraception and continued to do so. That was John Kipley with Natural Family Planning, and a doctor out in Colorado with all his experimentations. 
in favor of natural family planning and writing. Years ago, I came to regard such opposition, as I've already mentioned to you, as contraception revisited. The compromise in Washington was, as it was known always as the truth of 1970. George Weigel adds a little point here. The lesson learned was that one could reject moral teaching of church doctrine, church doctrine which had been solemnly proclaimed with impunity. Obedience to ecclesiastical authority was somehow rather optional. That disorder and indiscipline followed, we should not be surprised that it did. Quote from George Weigel. The recent statement of the Convocation of Catholic Education does not have the same weight as an encyclical, such as a Mani Vitae. It was not done, prom it didn't have a, prom a solemn promulgation. It's a directive based upon moral doctrine and may best be described as a prudential judgment made by legitimate ecclesiastical superiors and to be followed by all under their authority. An act of obedience to it, including myself. It said, uh, okay, it has the approval of the Pope, but it's not encyclical. Nevertheless, it is difficult to hold that some criticisms of the document are anything less, this is a quote from Newhouse, than a rejection of the church's constantly held doctrine regarding human sexuality and homogenital acts in particular. The focal point of the critics of the document was the instruction that persons seeking to enter a seminary or to be admitted to holy orders must not be engaged in homosexual activity or have deep-seated homosexual tendencies or support the so-called gay culture. Now, Dr. Fitzgibbons will treat this with great care a few hours from now, okay? Among the objections were, what does it mean to practice homosexuality? A support for the civil rights movement of homosexuals, a form of support for gay culture. These are some of the questions from the critics. And what is meant by deep-seated homosexual tendencies? Now, those criticisms themselves can be handled very well. I'm not, we gotta get on further with how other people responded. While these are legitimate questions, many of the challenges to the instruction have a quality of dissimulation, implying their rejection of magisterial teaching. As an example of such dissimulation, which is discussed in greater detail by John Richard Niehaus, we have the case of a dialogue, if you will, or a conversation, if you want to call it that, between Jesuit Father Thomas O'Brien and his provincial superior, Father Robert Scullin, S.J. Father O'Brien rejects the statement that homosexuality is objectively disordered, a statement which is part of Catholic teaching found in Section 3 of the 1986 statement the, 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 the pastoral care of the homosexuals. Uh, a sense of objective disorder simply means that a tendency of the person is moving in the wrong direction. In other words, being attracted to people of your own sex is not meant to be. In 98% or 97% of the human race, the attraction is a male to female, female to male. It, it doesn't leave any room for a same-sex attraction. That is the norm. So uh, this is something, we're not saying that they, or for my 60 years or so work in this field, I never met a person yet who wanted to be homosexual. Years later, when they decide to be gay, then they, they brag about it. But when they first discover it, they don't brag about it. I've listened to so many people tell me that over the years. So objective disorder is a reality, the tendency is moving in the wrong direction. It can lead to nothing that is good. It is, it is an, an act that is, the act is immoral. Homosexual act is immoral. If that's immoral, the desire has to be a, a disorder. What else can it be? Okay. I just want to explain that because some people may not understand it. Okay. Now, let's get back to this controversy with the, with the provincial. 
the pencil's response, uh, that, that he, he understood the distress that caused Father O'Brien to speak out. But the provincial asked that no Jesuit, no quote here, takes any controversial step without prior direct consultation with the provincial. Notice the provincial didn't say, I disagree with him. He left that open. His mistake was not telling him first uh, as, a part, as a Jesuit, say. And, and of course, from that, uh, uh, that Richard John Newhouse was the conclusion. He says, put this way, the provincial did not say that he disagrees with Father O'Brien, but only that their conversation should be kept within the family of the Jesuits. He adds that this is their way of proceeding. That is, that, that, that is Father uh, Scullin saying that. Keep with their views within the family, that says the instruction, which merely implies that we don't have to worry too much about the instruction. Just be publicly discreet in one's repudiation of the church's teaching on sexuality. This is dissimulation. It does seem that the Jesuits are in the vanguard of the attack against the November 2005 document. The former editor of America challenges the position stated in the document that the church has the ultimate responsibility in the process of discernment of vocation to priesthood. His, he says that if, if, if someone wants to be a priest and you deny that opportunity, you're, de you're denying a divine right of the person to be a priest. If someone is called, the, called to the priesthood but is denied it by church officials, that is not a violation of a human right. It's he goes on to say, it's a violation of a divine right. This is Father, uh, Father Reese. The right of God to call whomever he chooses to the priesthood. Now, the view, uh, the, you can see how, how crazy that can be. The church teaches that, in the document that she alone must make a discernment on whether or not a person is fit for the priesthood. Uh, now, Father Reese is saying the direct opposite. Okay, the views also, and I'm not going to detail here, of Father John Coleman, S.J., and out on the Pacific Coast, and Father James F. Keenan, S.J., of uh, Western Massachusetts, are other examples of Jesuit repudiation of magisterial teaching. The Jesuits, however, are not alone proposing a thoroughly revisionist sexual morality. Among those who accept the church's sexual ethic, one finds significant differences in the understanding of the recent document. One, for example, Father Bruce Williams, who teaches at the Angelicum, offers the important reminder that contrary to the sex-obsessed culture, there are many people, including men, who discern a call to the priesthood for whom sex is not a big deal. Well, that could be questionable, I believe. Father Bruce Williams and Bishop Darcy both affirm the church's teaching on human sexuality. Bishop Darcy much more strongly than, than uh, Father, Father uh, Dominican. They welcome, the new, they, they welcome the new instruction. Bishop Darcy says that when it comes to the priesthood, the word must be proclaimed that the church is looking for a masculine men. In any case, uh, the, that's not a complete argument itself, but uh, what the, the argument, there's a wonderful article I have here, which I hope you have a chance to read in the April issue of First Things, is called In Conformity to Christ by a Dominic, uh, Benedictine, Guy Mancini, and Lawrence J. Welsh, who's I believe a teacher there, it's, it's worth reading, it's found in the April issue, uh, 2006. It's all about the, uh, not only masculinity, but it's about how a priest, uh, his effective maturity means that he identifies completely with Christ and he relates to Christ. He is, he takes the place of Christ truly in the mass and many other places and he's related to the church. The church is the bride, Christ is the bridegroom, and the priest ought to be just like the bridegroom, masculine. Very good. It's very well done. You want to read it. Let's get on now. Okay. 
Now Newhouse has a, beyond, goes beyond dissimulation. He talks about the smell of, mend of mendacity. There is a smell of mendacity, says Newhouse, surrounding much of the response to the instruction. It is all evasion and mendacity. However, one is able to cut through the, the obfuscation, I always like to say the obscurity of it, by inquiring whether they accept magisterial teaching that homosexual desire is disordered and homogenital acts are intrinsically immoral. We have to sort of cut through their arguments. The emphasis here should be on the act. I, I repeat that what we already said. If it's agreed that the act is immoral, then it follows that the desire to commit the act is immoral. One cannot have, this is well put, one cannot have a rightly ordered desire to do wrong. It's well put. And that's the key to the Catholic teaching. Someone over in Australia wrote a book supporting the gay movement, a priest. And they, he said the key to the Catholic teaching is this teaching that the tendency itself is an objective disorder. Newhouse fears, however, that it'll be a repetition of the truths of 1970-71. While the November 2005 document has been explicitly approved by the church and backed by the Pope's authority, will the same thing happen with the November 2005 document as happened with the Mani Vitae in 1968? Will official representatives of the church be allowed to reject the doctrine and the directives of the document with impunity? It follows that the church must make a discernible and decisive response to those descending from the November 2005 document, if, quote unquote, such a crisis is to be avoided. If there is no clear response from official church teaching, there is danger that the effective leadership of the Holy Father will be gravely weakened. Among those supporting the Holy Father, there is some uneasiness about several of his major appointments. It remains to be seen, this is my thought here, it remains to be seen how these appointments will work out. Newhouse, for example, is critical of some of the statements made by Archbishop George Niederauer, of course I am too, the new Bishop of San Francisco. Newhouse cites the following statement by Archbishop Niederauer, quote, also, some who are seriously mistaken have named sexual orientation as the cause of the recent priest scandal regarding the sexual abuse of minors by priests." End of quote. The Archbishop seems to deny a causal relationship between homosexual priests and the sexual abuse scandal. You just can't merely say it's the orientation. To be sure, the orientation may be regarded as one of the contributing factor, but that's not the only cause. Newhouse observes that more than 80% of the instances of abuse were with teenage boys and young men. Thus, it is painfully obvious that men who want to have sex with boys are more likely to have sex with boys than men who do not want to have sex with boys. <laughs> now, a defining test we're almost at the end. The gentle Holy Father does not relish direct confrontation with religious congregations like the Jesuits. With this Pope, as with all Popes, there is a fear of schism, which was probably what happened in 1968. Rome has spoken on the question of homosexuality of the priesthood in the present document. Underway is an official visitation of U.S. seminaries, both diocesan and religious, which will end in May. The findings will be sent directly to the Congregation on Catholic Education, which issued the new, the new November 2005 document. This congregation will report to the Pope. The Pope, in turn, will issue directives to the same congregation. 
again, new house. But that does not address the question of what will be done, if anything, about theologians and priests, backed by bishops and religious orders, who have thrown down the gauntlet in publicly rejecting the church's teaching and authority with respect to human sexuality. End of quote. Newhouse asks whether the church will cave in on the issue of homosexuality in the same way she gave in by not following the directors of Homo Vitae in a difficult situation. A few conclusions, and I'm going to ask, I know you're going to ask me questions, but I'm going to ask you, Phil, Phil in a few moments. All right, okay. Uh, number one, this is like a review sum summary. While many accept the norms for admission to seminaries and later holy orders, there's widespread criticism of these norms. Some of these criticisms amount to a rejection of authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church. Number two, like myself, theologians witnessed the way Cardinal Boyle's defense of Catholic teaching was not supported by many members of the American hierarchy who remained silent. Number three, in 1970-71, the suspended priests were restored to ministry with no punishment. That was called the truce. Today, many the theologians reject the norms of November 2005. How will the teaching church, the magisterium, challenge them? According to the Newman Foundation, uh, 27 Catholic colleges and universities are not in agreement with magisterial teaching in their theology courses. But the Newman Foundation does not have the financial means of reaching all American Catholics who want their children to have solid courses in theology. Okay, I mean, solid in accord with the church. Recommend, I, I think on the, I'll skip over the first recommendation and just make a question out of it. For years, Catholic psychologists and psychiatrists have been looking for an international conference on the interrelationships between moralists and psychologists. We need to work together from our respective disciplines. We will try to do such a conference, I hope, in America first, then go to Rome, or even the reverse. Let me summarize it all once more in terms of questions. In view of the 1968-1970 failure, to follow the teaching of Amani Vitae, the failure to support Archbishop of Boyle and the stand of the Catholic Rebellion's priests, who are restored to ministry with impunity, what will the church in America do if we continue to allow the norms of the November document 2005 to be rejected by theologians and others as well, not just theologians? And the second question is, the, uh, as a result of the visitation of seminaries, and religious houses of formation? Will the Vatican give suggestions to improve formation in these institutions? Uh, I, I think it's a very important question because it, it, it isn't developed within the document too much, but to a certain extent. But for us who, who have been in the field for years, uh, we know that uh, the moral development of a priest involves constant attention to learning the habit of, of meditation. That's at the top of Secondly, to, ex, to developing a, a habit of self-discipline to fulfill all the requirements you have as a priest. So, there are two big ones. And uh, more recent years, in many places, things that have not been good. So I'll be very interested in what happens, what, what will Rome do in regard to this whole question of moral formation as well. Thank you very much.